Again, I'm Melissa Spolstra. If you weren't here, I'm newest on the teaching team. My husband, Sean, is the Connections Pastor here at Stonegate. And I have the honor of uh, looking at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 with you guys tonight. So uh, kind of the title of our uh, lesson today is Moving from Shaken to Steadfast. And as I was thinking about this, it made me recall a story. My husband's a Jeep guy. He still has all four doors off of his Jeep right now in this cold. And he had all four doors off when it was like 110. So uh, he's a glutton for punishment. But he has loved Jeeps. This is his third Jeep. He's driven Jeeps for like 20 years. And at one point, I think it was with Jeep number two, he got brand new big tires and he was so excited to get them. But he noticed even just a couple days into these brand new big tires on his Jeep that things felt a little shaky. And he was like, well, I got a lift kit. Maybe this is just a different feel. But then it got really, really shaky. And he's like, something's wrong. And you know, like all good men do when something's wrong, they just keep going, just keep driving, right? Hope the problem will go away. (laughs) But eventually he had to pull over because it just wouldn't, the car would not continue to move. And so he called his friend who happened to also own a Jeep and they started inspecting the tires. And what they concluded was that the guy who put them on did not tighten the lug nuts because all of the lug nuts were loose. And on one of the tires, there were, were no lug nuts. They were gone. So the tire wasn't even connected to the Jeep anymore. So his friend's Jeep, they grabbed a few of the lug nuts off of that, put it on the tire until they could get it fixed. But the reason I was thinking of this story about the Jeep is that a lot of times uh, we need to tighten up our theology or our, our hold on truths that God has revealed to us previously in order to not be shaken. And I want to just read the first three verses of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and talk a little bit about this word uh, being easily shaken. It says, now, dear brothers and sisters, let us clarify some things about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and how we will be gathered to meet him. Don't be so easily shaken or alarmed by those who say that the day of the Lord has already begun. Don't believe them, even if they claim to have a spiritual vision, a revelation, or a letter supposedly from us. Don't be fooled by what they say. For that day will not come until there is a great rebellion against God and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the one who brings destruction. So we saw three don'ts here, right? Don't be so easily shaken or alarmed. Don't believe them and don't be fooled by what they say. So this uh, Paul is, is Paul, Silas and Timothy together are saying, you're going to be shaken. We're all going to be shaken, right? We've been shaken probably this week by one thing or another, but he says not to be easily shaken. Can you put up the slide that has the Greek word here, uh, that definition? I can't say it, so it's up on the screen, but it's the word in the text for unsettled settled or in uh, in the ESV it said quickly shaken in mind that's a great translation quickly shaken in mind because as we look at this word it's actually the word used for the motion of wind and waves it means easily shaken loose in fact this greek term was used of a ship that was not securely moored it actually means shaken of your sensibleness it is talking about the mind And so he says, don't be so easily shaken and then or alarmed. That next slide talks about what it means to be alarmed. And I thought this was so interesting because the shaken is kind of that initial motion, but alarmed is this continual state of agitation. Can anyone relate with being shaken initially, taken off balance, and then if we're not careful, we loop like a hamster wheel, don't we? Just a continual state of anxiety. I know for me, there's been some, as I was reflecting and going, when are some times I've really been shaken? And there's been quite a few things, but I thought about when uh, Sean and I planted a church together, and we planted it with our four best friend couples. And we would go to the training, and they would say, who you plant with is not who who will be there a year later because there's pioneers and there's settlers and we had all the training, but we'd go to the training and laugh and go, of course, we're going to be with those people. These are our best friends of a decade. But here's what I can tell you. A few years into the church plant, none of those families were still at our church and those relationships were really fractured and nothing has ever shaken me so much as trying to figure it out. Because these weren't like 
the people that are, were Paul is talking about here, he's like, these aren't unbelievers. These aren't pagans that are coming up. These are people claiming to have had a spiritual vision. These are people claiming to be aligned with Paul, that we have to have discernment even within Christendom to sort out what is fact and what is fiction. And I know in that season, I was, it physically shook me. I couldn't sleep. I couldn't eat. I lost 10 pounds. I was like a shell of a person internally, but also externally. And mentally, I just kept replaying conversations. How could they have said that? And did they mean that? And why can't we fix this? And emotionally, I would go from being sad to mad, to clinging to the Lord and trusting him to mad and sad, and just kind of this loop, this continual state of agitation. And it was during that time, actually, that I learned a truth that has stuck with me. Forgiveness takes one. Reconciliation takes two. (laughs) You can't make people reconcile with you, even if you're all believers. And I think that was this fallacy in my head was, of course, we can work this out. We all love Jesus. And here's what I can tell you. 15 years on the other side of that, some of those relationships were reconciled and some were not. But they will be in heaven. Praise God, right? We're all going to sit around the campfires of heaven and go, what silly little thing was that? And maybe for you, it's not something big that's shaking you. But can you think of something little this week even that just kind of took you off guard? I know sometimes I find myself driving and I feel this continual state of agitation. I have to review what was the thing that set me off. Was it an email that came in that I'm concerned about? I haven't even processed it. Was it something I saw on social media? I know for us, our foster son uh, was supposed to go to court last week. And we were, there was some trepidation for him. There was some trepidation for us. And the night before, they, they postponed the date. And it was just so frustrating. It shook me a little bit, you know? And, and that was just a little thing. And you process through that. We didn't get in the constant state. But can you think of just some little bit of news that you got this week that maybe just kind of threw you a little bit? And some of you are sitting here and you're like, Melissa, I, I honestly do not feel shaken right now. And let me just tell you, you don't have to make anything up right? Like, it's okay if you're in a season that's not very shaky, where things are relatively good. But here's what I want to speak to those of you who are like, I can't think of anything. Soldiers, even when they're not in a storm, not in a battle, what do they do? They prepare. They exercise. They check their equipment. Sailors, aren't always in a storm, are they? But they're always checking the riggings and making sure everything is correct with their equipment for when the storm comes. And so there's a verse there um, from Corinthians that I thought was just, it says, if you think you're standing strong, be careful not to fall. So if you're in a standing strong stage, that's awesome. Stand firm. But what you want to do is take these principles that Paul has given and tuck them back in so that when the day of battle or the storm or the shaky thing does arrive, that you're prepared and that you're ready for that. So the question I think we want to answer from what Paul's given us is how do we become less gullible? How do we become more discerning? Because that's going to be a key to help us move from to be less shaken to more steadfast, to standing firm. And the first one here, the first point here is just that sound doctrine helps us to discover deceptions. Remember what I told you guys last time, not everybody's a note taker. You're not going to judge your sister next to you for not taking notes. Some of you are just going to listen, but I have some things if you want to write down from the text. And what's so fascinating to me here as we think about the Thessalonians is when Paul says, don't be so easily fooled, don't be so easily shaken. The thing that they were dealing with is that someone had told them the day of the Lord has already begun. And I think what's so important here is to realize we need to identify the lie underneath whatever is shaking us. That's what was shaking them and putting them in a continual state of agitation for a couple reasons. First of all, I think one of the biggest lies the enemy loves to use is you're missing it. You're missing out. God has withheld something from you. Let's go all the way back to the garden with Eve, right? Isn't that what the serpent used? He's like, oh, the tree, the one tree that God told you not to eat from? Oh, you're missing the knowledge and all of the good things. And what I find is so many times when I'm shaken or something has shaken me, there is a lie underneath it and that we need to identify. And that sound doctrine, truth, will help us uncover what's underneath there. I know just this week I was struggling with my adult 
ish daughter who goes to college out in Arizona. And she's really struggling and she's saying these things and making excuses and And I started to be shaken by, is she going to make it in this world, (laughs) right? (laughs) Like, how is she going to be able to handle real struggles? Because she's made mountains out of these little molehills. But you know what I found the lie underneath that was shaking me? Was you missed it as a mother. You didn't prepare her properly, you know? And so identifying that lie, then we can replace that lie with truth. I think the enemy loves to use these two phrases. What if and if only, right? What if? I'd done a better job of preparing her. And if only, if only I'd been a better mother. So that lie, identifying that lie. And so what Paul does here is he says, hey, church, hey, Thessalonians, let me correct your theology. Let me remind you of the word I already gave you. And we don't have a copy of what Paul initially said to the Thessalonians. It was, it was verbally preached in a sermon during that time when he was actually in Thessalonica. But he, in the second letter, is like, let me re-remind you of some of the things that I said. And this is a tough passage. This is, I was like, oh, how did I draw this chapter, right? Like, this is, a, this is a tough one. But here's what I love about Stonegate, is that we don't skip anything. We don't just go for the low-hanging fruit. We're not just preaching from the bottom shelf. I remember serving under, my husband serving under a pastor that was like, oh, we're only going for the bottom shelf, just the things that are accessible. But what does that say about the word of God? Is all of it useful for teaching and for transforming our lives? If it's in here, God has a purpose for it. And so we want to pay attention to even tough passages like this. So I'm going to read uh, verses 4 to 12, and this is the New Living And I'm just reading it in a different translation to set it before you in a different light and to say, okay, what is the doctrine that that Paul is correcting for the Thessalonians and correcting that we can learn from? So he's talking about, in verse 3, he said, the man of lawlessness is revealed, the one who brings destruction. This is verse 4. He will exalt himself and defy everything that people call God and every object of worship. He will even sit in the temple of God, claiming that he himself is God. Don't you remember what I told you about this when I was with you? And you know what is holding him back, for he can be revealed only when his time comes. For this lawlessness is already at work secretly, and it will remain secret until the one who is holding it back steps out of the way. Then the man of lawlessness will be revealed, but the Lord Jesus will slay him with the breath of his mouth and destroy him by the splendor of his coming. This man will come to do the work of Satan with counterfeit power and signs and miracles. He will use every kind of evil deception to fool those on their way to destruction because they refuse to love and accept the truth that would save them. So God will cause them to be greatly deceived, and they will believe these lies. Then they will be condemned for enjoying evil rather than believing the truth. This is not low-hanging fruit, right? (laughs) So what we want to talk about here as a second point is that changing our questions will change our perspective. And what I mean by that is I want to just remind us again that we can't help but have a Western mindset. It's just what we were raised in. It's our culture. And this is an Eastern book. And we can get so tripped up, tripped up, especially when we're talking about eschatology, the study of end times, when we ask the wrong questions. See, a, an Eastern mindset is going to ask questions like who and what. And our Western mindset, we're going to ask questions like how and when, right? And so we have to say, okay, changing our questions will change our perspective. I want to remind you that we live in the already, not yet, when it comes to the day of the Lord. And what I mean by that is when we think about Jesus, he has already come and he has not yet come again. We're in the middle. But when it comes to the day of the Lord, man, if you put the day of the Lord in on a Bible search and look for every verse that comes up, I did that. Did anybody else do that? You're going to find some stuff. And it's going to be a little terrifying because it's going to talk about the terrible day of the Lord and you should watch for it. And it's a day of judgment. And there's several passages that talk about the sun getting dark and the moon turning to blood. I mean, this is not a happy, feel good uh, conversation about the day of the Lord. But what I want to remind you is that some of those prophecies, especially with the minor prophets and uh, the Old Testament prophets, 
Some of those were already fulfilled through the exile, through the destruction of Jerusalem. Some of those day of the Lord prophecies were fulfilled in history. And some of them have not yet been fulfilled. And this is why it can be tricky for us when it comes to our questions. And so as we think about the day of the Lord, I want to, Steph did a great job of telling us that, that, that it will be judgment, but it will also be relief. And that's so true. And we're going to see that. But for those of us that are like, this is kind of scary. I think there's two ways that the day of the Lord, uh, not in context or not understood properly, can be scary for us. And the first is that yesterday, maybe you forgot to pray. And maybe earlier this week, you gossiped. And then you read about the day of the Lord and you're like, oh no, am I in trouble? (laughs) Right? And what I want to clarify for us is just to remind us of the threefold nature of the gospel. And it's just that, that justification is the part of your salvation when you first committed your life to Christ, when you were saved from the penalty of sin. That word, I love to say it like, just as if I never sinned. That's what justification is. And if you are in Christ, if you have, com- if you have believed in your heart and confessed with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, you will be saved. And you have no fear of the day of the Lord because you have been saved from the penalty of sin. But where we are living right now is in the sanctification This is where you are being saved every day from the power of sin. Can you just, I can relate to that. Can you relate to that? We're just battling with sin, right? And and God has given us the Holy Spirit as a deposit who lives inside of us. But this is the part of your Christian life where you are being conformed to the image of Christ, your sanctification. And then the, the last part of your salvation is called glorification. And it's where you will be saved from the very presence of sin and are we so excited about that day? That's what eschatology should help us do, to live in the light of his coming, to know that he will at one point make all things right. And I think so many times confusion or lack of context comes is when we look at a passage that's about justification and we make it about sanctification. Or Paul's speaking about sanctification and we start to worry about justification. Let me remind you that the day of the Lord If you have been justified through the blood of Jesus, you have nothing to fear on the terrible day of the Lord because the Father is going to see you through the red lens of the shed blood of Christ. So the day of the Lord is hopeful for you. It's not scary. The second thing I think that can be scary about this conversation of the day of the Lord is that many of us have people we love who have not chosen to believe in their heart and confess with their mouth that Jesus is Lord. Maybe you have a sweet aunt or a neighbor who follows a different religion, or maybe you have a child that has chosen a different path, and you think about this this language about God's wrath on the day of the Lord, and it can be kind of scary. And especially as we think where it said, you know, God deluded them. uh, Did anyone else read that and go, that's kind of not fair, right? But remember, our question is not how and when, it's who and what. And we have to understand in the, in the way that the Hebrews would frame something, read the text carefully. It doesn't say that they had no choice. It says that they were enjoying evil rather than believing the truth. And they weren't as worried about the order as you and I are, right? It, it, they, they may have used language that made it seem like they had no choice, but as we look at the way a, an Eastern mind works for them, for them, God is so sovereign and he's a part of everything that it's like the chicken or the egg. Did you reject first and then that's God deluded? It, it's, it's like Pharaoh. God, God hardened Pharaoh's heart. And so that's one of those things we have to just realize that the order to the Hebrew was not as important as it is to you and I. We got to change our question from the when to the who and the what. I noticed also um, as we talk about these dear ones and this this wrathful part, I want to remind us that we live in a world that values what I call truce. It's like, just as long as everybody's getting along, you do you and nobody will get hurt, right? Our culture values truce more than truth. And we have a God 
that lives in the truth. And he is willing, he says, even sometimes peace comes with a sword. He's willing to ruffle some feathers to get to the truth. And here's the truth. God hates sin. Why does God hate sin? Because sin brings suffering. I mean, has anybody else here just personally experienced in your own life that sin brings suffering? I'm the only one. Okay, thank you. (laughs) Right? Sin brings suffering. Everything you have suffered up to the point in this year life is in some way connected back to the garden and sin. If sin hadn't entered the world, there'd only be two chapters in the Bible, Genesis 1 and 2. That'd be it, right? But all of this suffering, all of this struggle that we go through is connected to sin. God loves people, but he hates sin. And you were created in his image, and so was I. And so there's something in us that also has wrath towards sin. How do you feel when you hear a story of murder or rape or terrible things done against someone who is innocent? Do you know what you feel? You feel wrath toward that thing. And that's all that God is saying, is saying that he is on the day of the Lord going to make perfect justice. As we pray, right, on earth as it is in heaven. That's what's going to happen on the day of the Lord. It will be on earth as it is in heaven. So what should our posture be in that? I love this quote by, uh, by Charles Spurgeon. Can you put that under? If sinners be damned, at least that let them leap to hell over our dead bodies. If hell must be filled Let it be filled in the teeth of our exertions and let not one go unwarned or unprayed for. So if you read this passage and you feel unsettled about your sweet aunt or your neighbor or your wayward child, that is the time to pray. To say, man, if people are going to end up in hell, let them leap over our dead bodies. (laughs) That we would not let anyone go unwarned or unprayed for. And that this passage would just propel us to begin to pray and to share the gospel, the good news, that they don't have to, that there is another way, that the, the, the gospel message, that if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you can be saved from all of this wrath that we read about on the day of the Lord. Yeah. So when we want to ask, change our perspective by changing our questions, we want to ask questions like who? People. God loves people. And we love people. And we want to pray for them and warn them. And what? The gospel. The truth. And so all of that in light of the day of the Lord. I also want us to remember, in the Old Testament, we find all of these glimpses of Jesus' first coming, right? I mean, you read Isaiah, and there's so much in there that feels like you're just reading an account of what actually happened to Jesus when he first came. But all we got was an outline, not a manuscript, right? Can you imagine writing the manuscript of what actually happened when Jesus first came to earth based on those glimpses and prophecies? I mean, no one could really do that. And I want to remind us as we think about eschatology and times, which is 1 and 2 Thessalonians is fraught with it. I want to remind us that God has given us the outline, not the manuscript. And we want to be careful about over-concluding from the text itself. I mean, I I did some study on the man of lawlessness. I would encourage you to do it on DesiringGod.com. John Piper does an excellent job of explaining the man of lawlessness and how it's tied to Revelation 13 and the Antichrist. But let's not forget that 1 John tells us that, that many Antichrists, little a, would come into the world first. And we don't want to overconclude. Christians, we're famous for it, aren't we, right? Oh, it's Nero is the Antichrist. No, it's Diocletian. It's Antiochus Epiphanes. How about during World War II? Who did we think it was? Hitler, right? And there's even been popes that people have tried to identify as the man of lawlessness or the Antichrist. And as we think about future events, I know that there have been times I've been like, Lord, what, what is... What's the, I mean, so much of scripture is apocalyptic. So much of it is full of prophecy. So there must be some value in us studying it and knowing it and kind of knowing the outline so that when it does start to play out, we're familiar with it. But at times I've thought, Lord, my great grandma loved you and she was living forward, pressing into the hope of your return and she died. 
And my grandmother as well was awaiting the return of Christ and she spoke of it and she was prepared for it and she knew the outline and she died. And I wonder, have you ever thought, I'm probably, I mean, is it going to matter that I'm going to know all of this? And I love, I was talking to my uh, adult daughter about this on a walk last year. And I was like, what do you think why there's so much prophecy and so much apoc- so many things about the end times and we may not even encounter it in our generation? And she said something I'll never forget. She said, mom, your great grandma prepared your grandma and your grandma prepared your dad. And your dad, she goes, it may be my grandchildren when Jesus returns, but part of the reason we need to know and study this and press into this is so that we can all prepare the next generation so that they're equipped to see the signs and to know when this is all happening. I I, I thought that was kind of profound, out of the mouth of of babes, young adult babes, right? Uh, The truth. And another thing as we looked at this text, did anybody else lean into... uh, you know who's holding it back, right? Did anybody go, I don't know. Like, I want to be like Thomas and go, actually, Lord, I don't know the way. And so I studied a few commentaries, and it was interesting, and I think we want to be careful not to over-conclude, but the consensus of the scholars that I read said that this was likely a reference to the Holy Spirit. And one of them said something, and I'm not 100% sure, but I thought this was interesting. He said, the Holy Spirit lives in believers today. And so that alone is holding back evil in the world. That the spirit of God is in you and you and you and me. And that until Christians are taken and gathered up to Jesus, evil can't rule and reign because the Holy Spirit is here inside of all of us. I'd never thought of it that way before. So um, it helps in passages like this to dig and think and to say, Lord, what, what are the questions I have? And what, what is it? Who is it? And what are you trying to do? And so I wonder for you, how is God calling you to shift your questions? To focus more on what has been revealed than the question marks next to it. I mean, how cool is it that Jesus is going to slay evil with the breath of his mouth, right? And you know, that's not something new. That's all over the Old Testament. It's in Exodus. It's in Job. It's in 2 Samuel. It's in Psalms. It's in the book of Isaiah. It's this personification metaphor about God that we don't have to fear evil because Jesus can slay it just with his breath. I mean, if he can speak the world into existence by his mouth, all he needs is a little breath, a little (sighs) to defeat the enemy, right? And so that should encourage us. We can focus on what is revealed and not as much on what has not been revealed. So as we shift our questions to say, maybe not asking, God, how are you going to fix it? But to say, who are you, God? And maybe not just when will this end, but what can I learn in the middle, in the midst of this thing? I know for me, when I first started teaching, because I was always the wallflower, I cannot believe I stand up and teach in front of people. If you've met my husband, you know who got the personality in our family, right? He is, he's larger than life. And he was always the guy on the stage. And I was in the background writing his sermon notes, right? That's how we, that's how we worked. And so uh, when the time came for me to, God called me to start doing this, I remember what would be paralyzing for me is when I would come off a stage I couldn't help. I would just ask myself, how did I do? How did I do? Oh, what did I forget from my notes? Or what, you know, what did I botch? Or what, you know, what kind of heresy was, was slipped in there somewhere? And the Lord really challenged me to change my question from how did I do to who am I becoming? And let me tell you how freeing that was for me. Because here's the truth. Even if I totally messed it all up, I can say I'm becoming a humble person, right? (laughs) And to say, who am I becoming? So I wonder if even for you, to say in your job or uh, with raising your kids or whatever it is that you're doing, instead of grading yourself with how did you do, a, a more Eastern question is to say, who am I becoming? Because that's what God is all about, right? All right, so we talked about sound doctrine helps us discover deceptions. We said that changing our questions can change our perspective. And the last point here tonight is that we can cultivate a mental diet that feeds our faith. I love this part. Let me read you these verses, 13 to 17, the last verses in the chapter. 
As for us, we can't help but thank God for you, dear brothers and sisters, loved by the Lord. We are always thankful that God chose you to be among the first to experience salvation, a salvation that came through the Spirit, who makes you holy and through your belief in the truth. He called you to salvation when we told you the good news. Now you can share in the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. With all these things in mind, dear brothers and sisters, stand firm and keep a strong grip on the teaching we passed on to you, both in person and by letter. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us and by his grace gave us eternal comfort and a wonderful hope, comfort you and strengthen you in every good thing you do and say. I love that Paul, after he does this, he's like, okay, I'm going to clarify some sound doctrine here. I'm going to help you understand and have a fuller, I'm going to identify the lies that you've been believing, but then I'm going to bring it back to who you are. If you could put up that slide of that list of all the things we just read. You are loved by God. You are chosen by God. You are sanctified by the Spirit. He encourages them to say, hey, you're believing the truth. There were some nuts that needed to be uh, tightened on your tires so you could keep going. But you are believing the truth. You are called by God. He just encouraged them. You can stand firm on God's word, on the teaching, both by in person and by letter. You can stand on that word. And that Jesus gives you an eternal hope. Here's what I know. Even if I'm not in a shaky period, if I have a steady diet of Amazon, social media, online games, or Netflix, I'm going to be easily shaken because I'm not feeding my mind with the truth of what God says about me. And so Paul just reminded them, this is where your mind should be. He talked uh, so much about being clear-headed throughout this whole book. I don't know if you've noticed the theme. Just in in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, he said, But let us who live in the light be clear-headed, protected by the armor of faith and love, and wearing as our helmet the confidence of our salvation. That was to protect their mind against lies of the enemy. I wonder of all of those statements... Is there one you just need to hold on to this week? Maybe you need to write it on a post-it note and put it on your mirror. Maybe you need to make it the screensaver on your phone. Just to believe what God says about you more than anything else. Paul told them the day of the Lord will come. It already has and it's not yet come. But the hopeful reminder here is that your suffering has an expiration date. It's not going to last forever. One day, Jesus will return. You aren't missing anything. God has done everything for you. And so I just want to challenge us to think about our minds right now. What goes into through our eyes and what we allow in through our ears. And I want to ask you a, a difficult question. I have it up there on the screen as well. How is what you are consuming in your mind specifically, either helping or hurting your ability to stand firm. Would you just lean into that for a minute and just ask the Lord? And it's not about one-offs. It's not about, oh, I watched a show last night or I listened to a true crime podcast that wasn't edifying. This, we're talking about patterns, the pattern of what, you, what kind of food you eat mentally. Because just as you eat food physically and put things into your body, you are putting things into your mind mentally. And Jesus encourages us. And Paul says, here, don't be quickly shaken, easily shaken in your mind. I want to end with just a couple verses from a few other places. This is from Isaiah 7-9. Isaiah said this, he said, unless your faith is firm, I cannot make you stand firm. Unless your faith is firm, I cannot make you stand firm. So as we think about our mental diet, to say, which one are you feeding? Are you feeding faith or are you feeding fear with what goes into your mind? And then I love this one from Hebrews 12. I'm going to read verses 27 and 28. 
He said, this means that all of creation will be shaken and removed so that only unshakable things will remain. And since we are receiving a kingdom that is unshakable, let us be thankful and please God by worshiping him with holy fear and awe. Here's my admonition as you think about your mental diet. What are the unshakable things? So many things that we put so much time and effort in our minds to are going to be shaken and they're not going to, they're not going to last forever, right? So what are those unshakable things? The word of God is unshakable. You came out on a Monday night. I bet you were tired. <laughs> I bet there was a, maybe a mental conversation in your head about whether you were coming or not, right? Yep, I see you. <laughs> but you decided to come and put in and to strengthen your mind and your heart by being in community and by getting into God's word. And so you might just look and engage this week coming up. And think about, at the end of each day, just kind of do a review and go, what have I allowed in my eyes and in my ears? And is it helping me stand firm when life comes to shake me up? Or is it putting me in danger of when I am initially shaken, getting into that loop, that hamster wheel of continuous anxiety? Because here's the truth. God doesn't want that for you. He wants you to know these things. What's the next? That go, go back to that slide. I think there's that one in front of it that has all of those uh, you are statements. Yeah. You are loved by God. You are chosen by God. So what I'd love for us to end with tonight is just grab one other person, and not groups of two, and if you're, you know, find to where you can get into groups of two. And I'd just love for you to quickly pray over the woman and pray the helmet of salvation on her head. And just pick out one or two of these things to say over her. This is just going to take a couple minutes. But we're going to end in this way. I'm going to pray. And then I'm going to let you guys get with one other person. And just pray for that helmet. Specifically for the week to come. And just pray some of these truths over her. Father God. We thank you for your word. We thank you for Second Thessalonians chapter 2. We thank you that your breath can slay evil. We thank you that you don't want us believing lies from the accuser, from the enemy. So Lord, would you help us just continue to develop sound doctrine so that we can discover the deceptions? Lord, would you help us change our questions? That we would want to know you and we would want to know what you're doing more than the hows and the whens. And Father God, Lastly, we just pray that you would help us to be so aware of where we've allowed the enemy to slip in with untruth through our mental diet, through what we listen to and what we watch. God, would you protect our minds with your helmet? And Lord, now as we pray for one another, I just pray that women would leave here tonight encouraged and excited for the hope that we have in you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.